Greetings. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I'm Lexi Eve, and today I've got something very special for you guys. Welcome back to the second installment of The Mage Behind the Magic. So in the first video, I interviewed a dear friend from the Golden Dawn, now living in India, practicing Buddhism, Edward Rive. And it's been some months, I've recorded a lot of other content, but today I want to introduce somebody very special to me. And that is my fiance and partner of just over uh, six years now, Juan Ramirez, um, known on Facebook, G. De La Luz. He is a member of the Temple of the Lima, a chief of Iowas Temple in New York City. He's been a practicing Delamite for somewhat over 25 years now. He is the founder, or perhaps co-founder is better to say, of the Congregation of the Lamp of Invisible Light, um, which I am also now a member of. And there are sanctuaries in Mexico City, where it initially started, and NYC, Tijuana. And it's, it's a growing group, it focuses on the light of the heart, the hermetic lamp, etc. I have videos on my channel if you're interested in hearing more about the congregation. And so yeah, he's been a practicing occultist for many, many years, and we're going to dive into a whole vast array of subjects about magic, about life, how the Lima has affected him as a person, as a magician, and so without further ado, let's dive in. All right, 93 is, hello, hello. Hello, hello, and I want to, just for the fun of it, um, and maybe some people may not know what 93 means. I want to say the full, f the, the entire phrase. Do what thou will should be the whole of the law. To which I'll respond, love is the law, love under will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. This is the second installment. Um, I've wanted to do this for some months. So for those new to the channel, the mage behind the magic, I, my goal is to do these interviews with people from as many traditions as I can across the board. I don't care what you practice, but if you're on a spiritual or occult path of some kind, I want to know, I guess, what brings people to magic initially, what developments happened in their life over the course of their practicing magic, but also I want to aim to, as the mage behind the magic, um, destigmatize the occult and, you know, obscure spiritual traditions, there's still a lot of taboo um, surrounding occultists and people hear that word, they instantly equate it with Satanism or devil worshippers. And so I want to humanize magicians as much as possible. So yeah, I want to talk about um, all of those things, how you got into the occult, um, how the Lima has affected you, starting various groups, working with various groups, um, how that's changed you, what your development looked like, but also um, your personal life somewhat um, on a mundane level, how the Lima has helped you, whether it's career-wise, um, in relationships, interacting with people, interacting with the world. So I guess my first question, um, and we spoke about this personally, but to let everybody else know, how was it that you found the Lima, which is your primary tradition? Uh, well, I mean, there was a lot of things and it's a lot to unpack there, but you know, like, um, how, I don't know if there is a right, well, let me just say, I think it is something my, that I observed in my, you know, like just meeting so many people, so many occultists, people that want to join in, I think is you realize there's something in you that has to be expressed. And in my experience, the Lima is the closest thing of what humanity needs at this point in time in space. So it's sort of like things fall in place. And if you are, if you have an incline to follow your intuition and follow your heart, then you will understand that um, absolutely makes sense. 
like is basically makes sense. So, so then my next question, you had said, uh, in your view, the Lima is something the world and humanity needs. What is that specifically that the world needs? That it, how can the Lima help people? Well, I mean, I'm gonna quote basically like what Crowley was trying to do, you know, over and over and constantly with all his publications and he's, you know, taking over orders and creating orders and all that is basically to give some kind of focus, which is what every, any religion has to do, which is give people focus, spiritual focus and, and a path. And basically is our stage right now is to uh, discover our will or commonly or most precisely we should say our true will uh, capital T mm -hmm. capital W mm -hmm. which I'm sure you already kind of discussed where is the difference between just like will versus want you know yeah, something that you need that to thing. do versus something I just want to do because I want to do it and I don't care about the consequences or how it affects anyone else right so it's basically this discovering your true will mm -hmm. and doing your true will mm -hmm. and do nothing else mm -hmm. that sounds very simple mm -hmm. very quote-unquote easy to do mm -hmm. but it's absolutely a huge humongous challenge absolutely and then after that um, or while doing this you're going to have a very particular and sacred experience which is the knowledge and conversation with your holy guardian angel mm -hmm. so those are the first steps that we as a human race we need to do and is not I'm gonna say this is this is nothing new and I don't think that Crowley was actually reinventing reinventing the wheel is something that has been shared in many traditions and but the thing is that how and we can talk more about how the progress you know the progression of the you know consciousness and the eons we all we all as human race are, are transforming ourselves mm -hmm. and there's certain emphasis in different eras and I think in this era is you know Crowley kind of distill those spiritual steps that we have to take for the now for right now and kind of remove all the crap that has been floating around and obscuring you know like the basic things that we really need to focus on so one of the things that I really appreciate about Thelema is is very practical and is very kind of removing everything that is superfluous and that is in a way confusing and that is kind of blocking us from a real experience. One of the other things that it kind of forces people to do is take responsibility for their own spiritual life. Mm -hmm. There's no more of that, you know, like sitting in the back seat and just waiting for somebody else to kind of drive the car. You have to like learn how to drive, get your driver's license and jump in the car and be responsible for, for what you're doing. Right. Which is part of the past aeons that is you know, you have a high priest, and the high priest is the only contact with the, high, the job of the high priest is have direct contact with with whatever god, deity, etc. And this high priest slash pope, etc., is going to communicate that to uh, the congregation or the followers, and they just passively follow that. Right. There's no more of that. You have to take responsibility for your life. I like the analogy. Like you get in a car and now you have to drive this. That's your spiritual mode of getting back to the divine source and getting yeah. in contact with that. Um, and it, whether you have a physical teacher or the HDA, somewhat like a spiritual teacher, in my view, you need a physical, mm -hmm. a person mm -hmm. to help you with that. 
Well, what I'm saying is it's like they give you the directions of where you need to go, sort of, they, or they can help you figure out and plot your course on, on the map, but then you need to get there. Correct. Mm -hmm. And as if, like, we all, I, I believe the majority of people are listening to this, they know how to drive a car. You can understand that there's difficulties in anything that you're approaching for the first time that is going to be you know, times that you are going to have hopefully not like a drastic accident, but at least see the danger of now I'm in control of this car and whatever I do is I am actually on the wheel and I'm turning and I'm stepping on the gas and, you know, I need to kind of gauge my movements and pay attention to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of responsibility, but it's a responsibility that we have to do. Like we have to take this on as a race. And unfortunately the forces, I, I don't want to sound apocalyptic, but the forces of darkness, they're always around us. It's not like this is new. We're always been dealing with this, but the focus is different now. We have to be more active. We, we have to participate in this spiritual development ourselves. So Crowley writes like every man and every woman is a star and so what that means in translation is that we all have an orbit, we're all going in some type of straight line um, and doing one's true will is following your orbit as a star. So being behind the wheel of that car just because you're following the rules, you're going at speed limit, you're careful of every turn, you're and you're responsible for your actions behind that wheel, there's a lot of people that are not responsible in their actions they'll still deal with the consequences but they may crash into you while you're driving and it may not be your fault but you now have to deal with the consequences so that's my understanding with humanity it's like we all need to be doing this responsibly figuring out what did we incarnate for kind of and taking a you know accountability for our spiritual development our mental development our physical development and trying our best not to crash into other people along the way right there's a, there's a lot of space mm -hmm. to move around and there's no reason why we should be colliding with one each other. We all have our own designated path, which is also um, pretty fascinating. You know, we all have a specific, when I say a specific path, is something that we came here to express that nobody else can express. Mm -hmm. But yourself and that's the beauty of it so there's um, a couple of things I want to move into um, professionally you're an artist and I know you've been an artist your whole life since you were a kid you were fascinated with um, building models building things with your hands painting putting things together um, and then as you grew up painting, drawing, getting into internships and different jobs even as like during summer, you know, at, while school was out, um, all of that stuff. So I wanna get into art and how spirituality has developed. But before we get to that, um, I wanna just bring up, so you're a member of the Temple of the Lima and how long has it been that you've been with them? It's been 25 years, roughly. And you got involved in California Back yeah. in the early 2000s, late 90s, around that time? Yes. I guess what are some key moments that come to mind that because you've been in this order that you've seen spiritual development come? Are there any key moments that come to mind because of your work in the temple? I think um, because I, I can say this. I didn't expect to join the Temple of Thelema, let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and this may apply to everybody, and I think it does, that you are guided. Like, there's something that is always guiding you. Mm -hmm. Even if you resist this, you're going to be kind of forced to do certain things in your life. Mm -hmm. um, regarding your spiritual development. So we, I, I have the belief that we always have this, um, 
this voice, this in, this internal voice that is kind of letting us know, it, it could be interpreted as intuition, or call it whatever, but is something that kind of put things in order for you to find certain people or find certain doors that are going to open your way. So I absolutely believe that. And I can give you more details on why I believe that, but I ended up in San Francisco not even wanting to be in the United States. Right, your plan you was know, to move to Europe initially from was, Mexico. Exactly, so my, my journey was kind of taking a big detour and I things aligned for me to find this group of people that were doing the spiritual work under the manner of Temple of Thelema and I said I think I need to do this mm -hmm. and this is why I ended up in this place. I recall um, from personal conversations so way back then when you were first finding the temple you were into yoga initially and right. then you had found um, the Crowley Thoth Tarot and I remember you saying you then bought the Book of Thoth and it was just like, whoa, this is overwhelming. Right, so, yeah, I was going, I, I was not going into a lot of details, but I, and this is going also with the, um, there's always a contention between you and the angel. There's always something that your ego wants and your ego is making plans and is plotting and is deciding you know how your life is gonna go but once you start kind of invoking the force of the universe or get involved with spiritual work things are going to start kind of responding to your life mm -hmm. so before i moved to the united states i was interested in developing spiritually is something that you know I think we all have and at some point we kind of repress because spiritual dedication requires a lot of energy and is in a way kind of scary like we have very um, how can I say this like very bad image of what a spiritual life is um, coming from the Catholic Church or the main religions they all kind of distort this idea of what is the con what is your contact with God and it's basically you don't have a direct contact with God you have to go you have to go through a, a priest so it's like this doesn't I don't connect with that because you know it's just a priest that is going to tell me what to do and I'm not interested to hear what other person is telling me so there's a lot of like mm -hmm. disconnection so but the moment you feel that push and you start listening, um, the universe kind of responds. Mm -hmm. So, I, and this is something that I always kind of have since I was a kid, that I had that this need to have this understanding or connection with the divine. So, I, you know, like I would know supervision I started getting interested in yoga interested in the occult interested in you know in in all these topics there at that time there was no internet there was no a lot of publications in Mexico so I was I was a little disappointed but um, one of the things that were available was the Thoth deck and so I got one and I didn't even know who Alice Crowley was so I got the Book of Thought and I was... What was your first impressions of the images? It was, uh, it was amazing. Like that's... It was not my first deck. Mm -hmm. um, it was the... What it was called, the Rider Waite... Smith uh, deck? Rider Waite Smith? The, uh -huh. the, yeah. At that time it was just called the Rider Waite. Mm -hmm. um, which is what, you know, most of the time people get that's the first first yeah it's the most common the most common um but when i got the thought deck 
I felt absolutely fascinated with the power of the imagery and um, my subconscious responded directly to the images because I'm a trained artist that you know like I I work with images I, I'm a visual artist so it, immediately I responded to it so I wanted to I wanted to know more about it I got as I said uh, the, the book of thoughts and as many people that are hearing this, they probably know it was the last book that uh, Alistair Crowley wrote, so it's the most ref referential of other work mm -hmm. that he had already published. That if you don't know what he's talking about, you are, well, he expects, he's expecting you to know his body of work at that point. Right, when he says verse seven from Lieber X, Y, and Z, he's expecting you to have that book in your possession or to have memorized that passage. Correct. And if you don't understand, what does Lieber 333 mean? <laughs> or, you know, it's the book of lies in a certain chapter. You're not going to be able to follow what he's saying in that book. It's so complex. So as a first book, I can imagine. It's like, ah. Absolutely. But it was, instead of being discouraged, I was even more enticed. I was like, I need to know exactly what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's how he started with, with the journey of getting books, uh, you know, from Alistair Crowley. And I was even more fascinated. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got more and more into this rabbit hole of the occult and Alistair Crowley. So basically through the thought thing. Right. And so then now in California, you were visiting, I know, Phyllis Seckler on what, like a monthly basis or something? She would do well, little groups? Well, first I was, um, I signed up for the uh, classes. They were like public classes, mm -hmm. you know? There were discussions and stuff like that. And I, I, um, I applied for, for joining the temple. Mm -hmm. Eventually I did, and then I, I was able to connect with more people and you know so of course at that time Phy Phyllis was living in Oroville so she was holding classes this is towards the end of her life and I'm so glad that I, I got to meet her in person she had many stories and she's a lovely lovely amazing human being also an artist, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, I was. I'm, I'm so glad. I feel so blessed that I was able to come to her classes, uh, listen to her stories. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah, she is a source of wisdom, for sure. And from what I've I've never met her. She's before my time, but from people that I know that have spent a lot of time with her, um, she was. A force in and of herself. She knew what she wanted and she knew how to go do that and um, very self-reliant and had a lot of information, a lot of practice and a lot of study from many years under her belt. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really inspirational figure. So the fact you got to sit down with her so many times to me, that's really yeah, that's, cool. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was great. So now it's still in California, so you were around for like Oz House and Knox House and all of that stuff. Or, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we don't have to go too much into that, but I know you were around for all of that. It was just a much different vibe than I think how it is today. Especially, I've only experienced the West Coast once, and it was very recent. So, and the East Coast is much different. It has a New York vibe. People are very solitary on the most part and they people open up to you after a while but california is very love and hey this is who i am and i don't care what you think and nobody cares what it what i do as long as i'm respectful about it and who i am as an individual is pretty much okay we're here in the east coast is very cloistered it feels like kind of jaded yeah and, and, and of... it's like this is coming from me that once again, I'm coming from Mexico, but at that time, it was a very vibrant community. Mm -hmm. And it was very much kind of like a melting pot of, 
you know, you can go to a place and there's like all the kinds of people practicing so many different traditions and and it was Thelema was very it, it is very kind of accepting of whatever you're doing is okay if it's okay with you like you, you should do it so there was no like there was no, I mean there's always kind of like with groups there's always some kind of you know there's a little bit of personalities and all, all that but I, you know in general I'm just gonna say that it was very kind of in, inclusive and very open Mm-hmm. And vi- you you can see that is going on. Once I moved here, is as you're saying, is like the vibe is different. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got I moved here in to New York like in 2002, mm-hmm. and I'm not quite sure. You know, I don't want to repeat any kind of rumors or anything, sure. but I think. Um, the community was a little bit dormant, at, at least for me, me coming from San Francisco, it felt like um, there was more, not as visible, let's just say, as it was in California. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I guess it's the same, whatever you go, there's a different flavor, and I think it should be that way. You know, if you go to Texas, or they if you have go, their own style, yeah. They have yeah. their. Everybody has their own style, depending on where you are. I think in New York, it's like the Satanic Panic was kind of like the big epicenter of occultism in New York City, and then once a, a lot of stores like uh, Magical Child closed down, and some people passed away, some people stopped practicing, some people moved away. I think the energy kind of. There was a lot of enthusiasm, and then as a result of all those things happening, it was kind of got quiet and very few in comparison to how it was in the 70s and early 80s. Um, I think that might have affected the change. Right. I I mean, I wasn't here, so I'm not Mm -hmm. going to speculate exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, I mean, just going back to the path and not into the social dynamics, um, as I was saying, like, there are things that... um, happen in your life that will give you a clue of where you should go or what you should be doing and I would like to use this opportunity just to encourage people to do that just follow that you know inner voice that is telling you 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 know that you always wanted this or that but at the same time this is a little bit like a contradiction you have to be prepared that um there's something that is not i mean is your ego maybe telling you it's like an interesting dynamic Mm -hmm. let me see if i can say this how can i say this i believe that the dynamic is that you're your subconscious, like your HEA, your Holy Guardian Angel, speaks through your subconscious. Your subconscious is in communication with your ego. And your ego is getting clues from your subconscious to do certain things and to do, you know, do certain things or move Mm -hmm. to certain places or whatever it is that is actually coming from your intuition. But the ego has to have some kind of um, logical, quote unquote, reason for doing this. And the ego is a little bit tricky. Like it will tell itself that you're doing this for this or this reasons. That is not really the real reason. The real reason is coming from your intuition. Mm-hmm. So there's the a little bit of a disconnect and we have to be aware of that, that that's when we tell ourselves that we're doing this for X or Y reasons Mm -hmm. but actually is because there's a bigger picture that is going to be disclosed once you're in the middle of like that experience. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's too complicated. Absolutely. Yeah, so what I'm getting is like 
you have that little voice inside of you that's telling you or tr driving you in a certain direction and sometimes people fight it or sometimes the ego latches onto that little voice and misconstrues either justifies why I'm doing something or tries to tell you to do something else and you have to differentiate what what the intuition is telling you to do and where you need to go versus what the ego is telling you to do and also sometimes the ego will justify why you're doing something that is just based on your soul your spirit your intuition your HGA and that's not at all why you're doing it um, you're doing it because you need to based on whether it's karma based on whether it's true will along those lines yeah I mean. and I guess what I'm I guess what I'm trying to say, you know, just to kind of like simplify it in a way, mm -hmm. is that you should analyze your reasons. Like, in a way, like, Absolutely. I'm not, I don't want to say the word second guess yourself because that could be paralyzing. How about you're always second guessing yourself? But you should be aware that your the forces that are moving your life should come should come from your holy guardian angel and not your ego because Learning to your differentiate ego the two is going to yeah. guide you astray and mm -hmm. you're going to end up in a bad place however i think even in a worst case scenario you're going to learn something from any situation that you end up in mistakes everything like I always good, say good, bad. accept any mistakes that you make in your life don't feel sorry I mean feel sorry that you made the mistake but it's something that you needed at that point and it's something that you know you create like you create this whole series of events that ended up you in a certain particular place or situation right. for you to learn something about yourself right so I don't know. Another thing I wanted to bring up, so we met um, in 2015. It was my first public ritual. I had been studying on my own for quite some time, but um, I, a mutual friend online, I didn't know her at the time, she recommended LIL, the Lamp of Invisible Light Ritual, for me to go to because I was asking, hey, are there any public rituals where I can get a feel for what a group environment feels like? And this person recommended I go there, and so I had met you for the first time. Um, I was pre-transition at that point, and I was dealing with a lot of fears and stuff on that on that side. But um, so I, I remember LIL seeing somebody in a towel rope for the first time with the Eye of Horus emblazoned on the front, and then I'm seeing things based on my studies of Kabbalah in the ritual. Um, that I could see like, oh, this is symbolic of like the making of the universe. And it, I didn't know at the time it was based on the cube of space, but come to find out more about the cube of space, Sephiria Zero and all of that stuff. Um, the ritual is based on the cube of space, but I could see light being extended in directions or, you know, and it was creating a microcosmic universe. And to me, that was super fucking cool. So I'd started coming to LAL a few times and I'd come to Iowa study group a couple of times. And there was one lecture in particular that was very impactful. So you've been giving public lectures through Iowa's temple for probably as long as you've been in New York um, on a, like a monthly basis or so. Uh, but one was on Libra Oz. And so I knew I was coming up on my transition and hearing Libra Oz I don't know if it was the first time I heard the text, but it was the first discussion on the text that I was part of. And so that, I don't know if you recall that lecture, it was in like 2015. Not that uh, in particular, but... I, and I, I think it was just a couple of us. Um, I don't remember who else was there except for a friend named Michael that I was running around with at the time. But yeah, you had given a lecture on Libra Oz and, you know, one thing that you had basically said was, um, and take responsibility for your actions. And so I've always held on to that. And so like going through Libra Oz um, as a Thelemite or just as a person new to the Lima, I think is super cool and find somebody to, or find a group lecture or find people that understand Libra Oz and talk about it. Um, but your lecture on Libra Oz was really, really cool. I remember we went through line by line 
and look for applicable examples of how would a person or how would I live this, you know? And there, there's interesting things in there, like man has the right to die as he will, and I remember you going in depth on that note, it's like, well, what does that actually mean? Because sometimes people die and it's like you can't control when you get sick, but you can control whether, okay, I'm terminally ill, do I want to end my own life? And I remember another example you had given, if you see a, like a kid run into the street and you decide, spur of the moment, to run and get that kid, knowing you're going to get hit by the car, well, you have a right by Libra's to die when and how you will. So there was, I just wanted to share that, you know, it's, I don't know if you even remember the lecture, but it was very impactful for me years ago to hear a lot of the stuff that you talked about and helped me in my development. I just wanted to share that with you. I oh, thought it thank was you. a cool yeah, story. I, I, yes, I always say that, and I said, you know, at the beginning, that this uh, Thelema kind of turns me on because you are responsible for your own life. Which is not, ex we're all responsible for our own lives. Mm -hmm. We just pretend that we're not. We blame others, we blame, we blame, we can blame anything, any, anybody but ourselves. So in this case, and I guess the point that I was making at that time with Liberals is that um, we, we have to take responsibility for our lives. Mm -hmm. We all are magicians. Even if we don't admit this, uh, even if we are not quote-unquote practice, practicing magic, we all are. We all have, a, we all visualize what we're going to do when we grow up, quote-unquote. When we're kids, we see ourselves, I'm going to be an engineer, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be an artist. Or, we're constructing our future with thoughts, mm -hmm. words, and deeds. So we are actually transforming things around ourselves to fulfill a, a vision that we have. Mm -hmm. So that makes us magicians. Absolutely. And the only thing that the Lima is doing is just re just accepting the responsibility for that and and put it into like a further spiritual development. That's all that we're doing. It's basically accept what we are, all of us, anybody in the world. We're all doing this. And just saying, hey, yeah, we, we do this. This is what we are human. And we have a responsibility. So just to switch it up a little bit, um... I want to turn a little bit to a mundane note. Um, as an artist your whole life, um, has the occult inspired you through your art? Um, I know you've done painting, sculpting, you have a, a website where you've made jewelry. Um, how has the occult changed you as an artist? Oh, wow, I mean, I, I'm fascinated with images and archetypes and all this stuff that is basically of the occult. In the occult, we use images and symbols and talismans and all these things that are designed to hit um, our subconscious, to activate our subconscious. That's how magic happens. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of artists that are practicing magicians because they understand, they're like trained to see these symbols and see them as alive because they are alive. So there was no disconnection at all. It was like the logical connection. There's like a logical path there. Mm -hmm. Like there's no... Does that make sense? Well, could you explain that a little bit? Like, the images that you see, they're alive. Could you unpack that a little bit? What do you mean? Like, like well, so how, when you see you... symbols in your mind and you say they're alive, what does that mean? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. That means that you know that they are. I don't know how to explain that. It's mm -hmm. like, you either get it or you don't get it. I see. It's like when you see something, you see that it is alive. I see. Um, 
I see, I see. So if you're looking at a particular painting and the detail and the strokes and the movement... It's not and... just one single thing. It's like the whole push of the the whole piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, like specifically... From the like dot art. forms, from the dot form where it arose to it, its except, completion. I guess like the... the I'm, I'm answering this as an occultist mm -hmm. and as an artist, but yeah. mostly as an artist. Like when you see something, you will feel it. I will feel it in my gut. I feel it like in my subconscious. I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to further explain it. Yeah. It's like you know this is real. Yeah. And many artists have that understanding that the only, like the, the images are real. And when you translate them into the material world, they lose something. They're the, the more refined artists are the ones that are capable of translating that image that exists in the astral, you can call mm -hmm. it in the astral or whatever, but is it, they can tame the media, the medium and being able to express the same idea in the material world. Mm -hmm. So our subconscious and our intuition kind of reacts to that image it is the same with magic when you're working with talismans when you're working with idols when you're working with anything that has some magical power if you go to um i don't care if you go to a to a church if you go to like a buddhist temple if you go to you know that those images have power mm -hmm. intuitively you know that they are powerful images because they would create, like, we all kind of have the same wiring. It doesn't matter where we are in the, on the planet. Mm -hmm. We all are human beings and we're all connected to, in some level. Yeah. So, because we all have the same wiring, we understand at some level that, you know, this is an image of power. And this has something that is that is in the astral that is vibrating in the material does that make sense i don't know if absolutely i don't know how, how else that, that I can was perfect explain this that was that was beautiful because it's like absolutely that was beautiful it's like trying to explain to somebody you know what is the experience of an orgasm it's like mm -hmm. well i can you know people can write yeah you know you have to experience you it. have to experience it like yes. you have to once you experience it, it's like oh okay yeah i understand that I see. Yeah. Okay, so we covered art, we covered Temple of the Lima, um, and I've covered LAL in other videos. Well, that that's one other thing that I could bring up. I have one topic I want to talk about, but before we get to that, um, can we go into LAL? Um, what inspired you to make the Congregation of the Lamp of Invisible Light? Well, I guess was that I wanted to have a public ritual that was not like the setting was not super complicated mm -hmm. but it was not compromising on the level of magic that was going to be performed mm -hmm. so it had to hit different um, things that needed to be right about which is, as I said, it was a setting that could be done in any space that was more or less square. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of furniture that is required. And the idea is to expose people to a highly concentrated, powerful, thelemic um, infusion of energy so that they could experience this. Mm -hmm. Like at the time, I believe, there was, it was started in Mexico City with a friend, and there was nothing really thelemic going on at the time, correct? Yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, when we started this whole thing in Mexico, was um, there was not a lot of... I mean, people, people who knew about Odyssey Crowley, they knew that they needed to either go to Texas or California or here or there. It was like, it was nothing going on. And me 
being from Mexico, I'm like, there's something that needs to be done about this. So that was another reason for, you know, for that and taking the, taking the I'm not going to say excuse, but it was, you know, it's like just retaking the first um, impulse that made Crowley start a, a new a new order after uh, the Golden Dawn uh, collapsed in the 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, started the LIL in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah. it, it became a good way to revive something that had a connection to Crowley in Mexico, bring the Lima. Right, and but it's, it, it's it is you said it's a very concentrated magical experience, and it it's gentle, but recharging and very very potent. Yes, it, it packs a punch, but not a not in a way that overwhelms you. In a way that you definitely feel afterwards. You could feel some type of change has definitely happened. You get that very relaxed sensation afterwards. And and I've, I've heard you say it's like you wanted to put as many the Lemic symbols that people coming to their first ritual can grasp all Correct. at one time without being overwhelming. It is, yeah. So I was a little bit, um, I'm not going to say sneaky, but I wanted to pack as much as possible in, in the ritual. For people that were connoisseurs, or they've been practicing for a long time, it's like, yeah, all this is very familiar. Mm -hmm. But also for people that have no idea, they at least have some kind of here for the first time and get familiar with with the Lima and the uh, three chapters mm -hmm. of the Book of the Law and Nuit Hadid and Rahu Kuit or Heru Raha. Mm -hmm. and how they work together is based on the cube of space, which is a model of the universe, uh, so on and so forth. So it's it's having all this in one point and and working in a way that is going to create some inner transformation, inner healing, and and positive vibes. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of service in your life, <clears throat> both from the Temple of Delima, um, doing lectures, leadership. Um, is service important to you? I think is one of the things that uh, Phyllis told me is that all the stuff that we know is not for us. It's actually for whomever is coming after. Mm -hmm. And that's the responsibility of the path that you have to constantly make sure that this this is passed on and the responsibility of of people that receive it is to be able to transmit it in a way that is respectful to the tradition mm -hmm. and that is preserved for for all of us mm -hmm. We're all in this. Like we all have to be responsible to each other. Right. And this is the this is the only way that we're going to, you know, like continue with this. Mm -hmm. So the next question I wanted to kind of maybe close on. If a person I know you've been in groups for many years, um, if a person's new to the Lima and they're doing their studies and they're looking into joining a group is there any words of advice you would give that person if they asked you, like, hey, how should I go about picking where, how do they find where they fit in? Is there any words of advice? Well, I, I would say that you, I think it's important that you are aware that now there's a lot of stuff floating around, especially if you go into, like, YouTube, the Internet, uh, that is not necessarily kosher <laughs> and do you have to be cautious about that uh, but I guess the most important thing is I'm just gonna say that don't think that having a teacher or following lessons online or YouTube videos are is actually good I'm not of 
the school that you can get an astral initiation and stuff of, of like that. Um, I completely 100% disagree with that mm. thinking. Uh, the reason, the most important reason that we have a body is because we are, we have to experience the material plane. And if you're going to do, you're going to take serious this path, you have to, you have to be in contact with a, um, a teacher. That's something I've heard you say uh, many times as we talk. So what, what is the value in your view of a physical teacher? What does that give up? Uh, I mean, this is. I was going to go a little bit into uh, the groups, and then I can go into the teacher in sure. particular. But okay, sure. so let's just go into like Pick the EC, you, like the EC way, right? It was like or the beginning, the very beginning. You are looking for something, and you just stay on the stage, let's say, of just playing a lot of videos and you know like you feel like this this um and i'm not saying that some videos are not i mean right and your channel is yeah, proof that you could have that, books you could listen to youtube but right but it's not the whole thing so mm -hmm. i want to remove that idea of like okay you know i'm a, an accomplished magician because i've been watching a lot of of mm -hmm. videos of course uh you need somebody to uh to bounce like ideas but somebody that is actually been doing the work so but let's just go back to the group like following that same train of thought um, I will encourage people to actually get in contact with a group and actually go to a physical meeting and feel the energy believe it or not your intuition your subconscious is gonna pick up on the energy of the group and the energy of the people and you may feel repel or you may feel attracted and you don't know exactly why so I encourage you to do that it's mm -hmm. it's the first task in the occult path is to find a teacher mm -hmm. and it, it, you, you learn about yourself and about the path just by taking on that task mm -hmm. Um, the second point is the teacher itself, uh, make sure that the, te the teacher has done the work, which is important, and it's not mm -hmm. somebody that is just pretending, that's mm -hmm. also important. Yeah. Um, titles and names and all this stuff, they don't really, I want to tell you this, this, they don't really matter. Right. Because, you know, anybody can call themselves whatever. Right. And it doesn't mean that they really have done the work. Right. So that's also something that you have to be careful uh, in that regard. Uh, I don't really pay attention to the titles and all that. I feel I I, I want to know more about the person and not necessarily that the titles. That they're like capable of transmitting something. Yeah, that they're you. actually in position of like the the current mm -hmm. so you only you can only experience that when you're in present in the presence of that particular person that you're considering mm -hmm. when you feel that the person is carrying the current and that's when you should follow that it, it made me think of something as you were speaking so like let's say in in your case right when you join the group Post initiation, what did you notice? Was there is there anything you could recall from way back when, like after you took your first real initiation, that like did you have a discovery moment? Did you feel a different connection to something? Oh yeah, absolutely. What absolutely. what changed after that process? A lot. Like everything changes. Mm -hmm. Like everything changes, and the moment you're you're going through a ceremony you feel this change mm -hmm. like it's is immediate mm -hmm. and I'm, i can only say one of the one of the things that i want to remind everybody is that what is for one person in this case what is for me is not necessarily what is going to happen to you exactly 
Um, because that could be another, you know, this hero worship can be, you know, like you're denying your own experience because you want, you're comparing yourself to so and so. Mm -hmm. And I don't want people to go through that. Like right. it should not be, right. like you have your own path right. and you're, on, you're gonna have your own experience. And the only way that you're gonna discover that experience is going through the experience. Right. But just going back to me, I'm gonna say that, yeah, everything kind of like changed at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing with initiation is that the word initiation is that you're just starting, like mm -hmm. you're initiating something. So you could, theoretically speaking, fall off the path, at least for this lifetime. You know, you can say, hey, um, this is very scary, like I can't do this, or you know, like I'm not ready for this. Mm -hmm. There's no undoing. Like if you promise this into the you to the universe, to God, to the higher self, to whomever, there's always witnesses and there's always like something that is guiding you that is like is saying, well. Your holy guided angel might say, I disagree. You are ready and you need to go through this. And there's going to be a struggle. Mm -hmm. So some people may experience struggle, like this kind of struggle after initiation. Uh, some people might say, no, this is perfect. That, you know, like I just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going into the word initiation. Initiation just means that you started something. And it's your responsibility. Again, I'm going to back to this. Is your responsibility to continue with the work whatever is has been assigned to you you need to continue with that mm -hmm. so you're creating like a karmic link to promising to do that work yes. in other words yes mm -hmm. yes it's important yeah I think a lot of people I've met they want initiation not realizing there's a lot of work that comes after that point <laughs> You know? Yeah, you don't really, you know, it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to scare people, but it's basically you're changing your way of life in a way. Mm -hmm. And it's for the better. There's that saying, um, we have a friend that passed away, Daryl, and he used to say this online quite often. It's like, chop wood and carry water. <laughs> it's like, before enlightenment, as a person, you need to chop wood and carry water. You have to do your job, whatever that is. Make your money, feed yourself, get dressed, wash right. yourself. Right. After enlightenment, you have to chop wood and carry water. You need to go to work, feed yourself, get dressed, clean yourself. It's like you still have to deal with life on life's terms, only you get a new perspective going exactly. through that I, process. Yes, I want to say I wanted to say that even though you're doing the same things because you still have the, you still have a body, you have a physical incarnation, you're living on the same planet, you, you're you're kind of linked to this material plane, you have to do those things that, uh, but you now you have the perspective of this water is going to, I'm going to make food from this water, I'm going to do like things that I can do so that I can continue doing the great work. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like, oh shit, this water again, like it, there's no, like the only, one of the things, or the most important things, no, I'm not going to say the only thing, but it's like one of the most important things is that once you take initiation, your life has like a more center, like it, it kind of has like a center of gravity mm -hmm. that didn't have before. Mm -hmm. um, this, just being a human is complicated and is very difficult and is very scary and that's what I keep you know, like, try to say that if you do this kind of work, it doesn't have to be with with Temple Philema or, you know, this or that, like, things that I do, like, I wouldn't be a good Thelemite if, you know, if I'm, you know, like, we're supposed to respect whomever, whatever you're doing, if you're mm -hmm. doing a Wicca, if you're doing, like, you're worshiping, worshiping Satan, good for you, that's great, like, if that's bringing you closer to yourself, you should keep doing that. So it gives you a new perspective of doing the mundane stuff while you're doing 
the great work. When we hear this word of, you know, this phrase, the great work is like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? The great work. Well, it means work. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it's actually hard work. It's physical work. It's like, you know, I don't know, if like you're setting up a ritual, getting the implements, if you have the ability, forging a cup, forging this, getting all that stuff is part of the great work. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. Getting a particular book that is going to help you in your in your path, that is part of the great work. Getting the money for getting the cup that you need for that ritual, it's part of the great work. All that is connected. Uh, it it makes easier for you to make connections and see. Be seeing the big picture. Mm -hmm. On the note um, of the great work, in tying it back to the idea of service, uh, we've talked in the past. So like. The Christian bishop, he carries um, the crook, which is for herding sheep, and uh, I, uh, this is just not super relevant to the conversation, but I thought it was kind of funny. Um, humanity in its current phase in the aeon of the child, sometimes it feels like doing service for humanity, trying to help people in conscious enlightenment, is sometimes not like herding sheep, more like herding goats. <laughs> You yeah, know, it's yeah, kind of it's... like that. It's not always easy. <laughs> but, so, on a closing remarks, um, before we shut down this lecture, is there any points or any things that you want to express, say, dive into? Yeah, uh, I was hoping that we could touch a little bit more on the very unbalanced, um, broken mentality that we're... We, st we still have the relation of uh, masculine feminine and inclusiveness etc etc I mean specifically how much damage the uh, patriarchal model has mm -hmm. done to everybody male female um, gay transgender like is just crazy we have to we have to like move from that we were watching something together just recently oh it was the barbie movie and i i say that because it portrayed the patriarchy in a very particular way and what upset us both about the movie was not the feminism we we love the feminism that's great but they ended with they went right back to the roles they were in where Ken was just a useless guy figure and Barbie is now is still in a matriarchy and there was no coexistence they didn't resolve anything on that level and it would have been I think a much more profound movie experience if the directors or writers had the wherewithal and the idea to see we are all human and we need to work with each other it, it can't be dominated by one side or the other side. It's like you have the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity, the feminine and the masculine. When one pillar is overly dominant, it destroys both sides. Um, and so uh, you had said in, in regards to that, that coexistence is a exactly. good... Exactly, so we... Uh, I know, like... I, Spoilers, wanna, by the uh, way, on Barbie. I, Sorry. I, I, no, that's, that's fine. I just didn't want to go too much into Barbie because it's sort of like a, you know, I don't know how long this yeah. this uh, interview is going to be floating around the internet and maybe Barbie is going to be forgotten or not. I don't know. I just thought but, it was an interesting... No, but one know. thing that uh, I mentioned is that at the end, like, the, the it's not resolved. And it's not like it has to resolve anything. It's just... Mm -hmm entertainment but it had like a very interesting kind of you know starting to push the envelope on on certain things about uh, feminism etc that is something that we've been trying to as a race we've been trying to kind of go around and fix mm -hmm. but there's I'm gonna say there's little that has been done regarding that like we need to put more attention to that and my belief in, in 
you know, with the, if we adopt, uh, the more people adopt this understanding of, uh, of the Lima and how it's, we need both sides or we need all sides. Mm -hmm. Not that is, because there's also controversy, you know, it's like, if, if somebody can do, like a transgender person can do a Gnostic mass, or if a, like a same sex couple can do a Gnostic mass and so on and so forth, like is, is why not? Mm -hmm. totally why the fuck agree. not? I totally agree, I'm on the same Like is here. really, why the fuck not? Right. Um, I don't know if this is gonna be blipped. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. It's a so, non-monetized channel. So there you go, so, so yeah, why the fuck not? We should. We should be accepting. Everybody has something to share, and and it should be encouraged, especially in the end of the child. Mm -hmm. And Which I'm is... mentioning the child because the child is the result of masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. So we're moving away from those very stiff archetypes, and we're kind of moving into a more a uh, fluid state. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this with the prominence of transgender uh, rights and and feminine female rights and gay rights we kind of like is making more uh, taking more steps on that but the fight was has been like crazy like it's not things don't change by on you know and it's on themselves we have to Voice. Make the effort and, and continue with this. This is something that right. it's a healing process. I see it as a healing process. We're broken. We are segmented and that's not how we're going to survive. Mm -hmm. We need to kind of move past this and we need to kind of like allow for the, the energy to move in the ways that it needs to move and we all express it in our own ways and that has to be respected. And it's something that is causing so much destruction right now right. so um, I see this um, opportunity as you know following this and being responsible and hopefully you know we can more people can listen to this and see hey you know what this let's leave the past into the past and let's move on with this new new um, understanding way, new way of living exactly yeah uh, ultimately my understanding whatever we don't do correctly we're gonna pay as a species collectively we are paying and we are right now we are <laughs> we are there's yeah. a lot of turmoil there's a lot of chaos there's a lot of hate there's violence there's there's all of those things there's inequality on many 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 fronts and it's, it's a lot that has to change and it has to change one person at a time by seeing well how do we go about this um, and I think the idea is all people have value all people are human we're all just trying to live our lives and so we can all bring something to the table to work together in a peaceful manner we don't have to hate or fear each other because of gender because I'm better than you because of skin color or gender or sexuality or whatever fucking label or whatever um, we can all collectively work together towards a better planet I think is a nice way of saying it um, but just keeping that view in mind and everybody has to participate in that because if only a few people are participating and those people happen to be bigoted in some direction whether consciously or unconsciously well, they're the ones that are going to be dictating the direction that we go in, so everybody has to be aware. It's a lot of work, but, I mean, that is the nature of the great work we've been saying. It's uh, it's not called the small work, it's the great work. It's a big process. It's an upheaval of human consciousness and change, and yet people are scared of fucking change. And, um, too bad. <laughs> it's going to yeah, happen regardless. And I want to say... I know that we're going into like mm -hmm. long, but there's another thing that I wanna mm -hmm. like. It's always kind of like percolating in my head is kind of Christian be a thelemite? Mm. Like, what would that be in the future? What what would the uh, you know all these main religions will transform in the future? Mm -hmm. 
and and of course the answer is yes like it, it's possible it's definitely possible there's um, there's warnings in the in the third chapter of you know corrections to the main religions um, what is causing most of the distortion and but there's in on themselves at some point they were connected with the source and unfortunately they got polluted and twisted and and manipulated and it, it ended up in what we have now mm -hmm. so if we're not careful and, and there may be already signs that you know anything that is connected with the source is prone to be distorted and manipulated and used for personal uh, agendas mm -hmm. but if you are really if you really understand how these things work you know that the one source can never be manipulated and distorted right it's a topic that I actually want to do a video on in the future uh, what would it look like for a Christian practicing the Lima well I it's mean very just fascinating think subject. about that is the end of the child Mm -hmm. So, my opinion, I mean, is something mm -hmm. that, you know, it could go either way, but is either, like, you have the... Rahulquit is is the god of war and, venge and vengeance. So, there is an equivalent in Christianity, which is uh, Christ as a judge, uh, coming back to judge the world. So, it's basically Christ judging the world, mm -hmm. which is equivalent of Rahul mm -hmm. but also it could be Christ the child mm -hmm. and I will have um, it will have more emphasis on the sacred part of Jesus which is basically the ferret mm -hmm. uh, or the holy guardian angel in mm -hmm. that regard so it's a little more it, it will have it's not impossible mm -hmm. but if somebody is interested in translating Christianity into the Lima it will be a nice project yeah. So as recovering, <laughs> recovering Christians can, at you least know, take a adopt, step forward into the new aeon. Adopt the new aeon, like come to terms can, with. Hey, you're not going to hell because of who you had sex with. Like that's okay. You can love, love whoever you want. You could just be a Christian and adopt Libra Oz. That might even be sufficient if you don't have the wherewithal to get into all the sophisticated magicians' tables and equivalating what deity is like what and. Etc. You could just keep it very simple. Okay, Libra Oz, but I go to Mass and I read the Bible and I worship Jesus. That that could potentially, it could be as simple as that to as sophisticated as equivalating, you know, God the Almighty with either Chachma or Kather or the Ein Sof or whatever you want to equate that with. Some, something above the abyss, the, the creating source. Right, the Holy Spirit as maybe Bina or some other aspect on, on the Tree of Life and synthesizing through Kabbalah some type of um, Christian, Thelemic, what is the equivalent of this figure? What is this saint like compared to something in the Book of the I Law? Mean, or yeah, book? I mean it was like, it was forced into like when it would center Ia. Like mm -hmm. it was forced into like translating these same images into other images and Christian images. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're trying to make like a quote unquote center Ia out of... Right, <laughs> right. You could it's still worship that... those figures. You don't have to say this figure is actually Horus. It's just there. there's an energy behind that figure that is similar to the energy behind this figure yes but that's like an interesting project i don't know if it's possible i don't know if it's like For beyonce real? you know like i don't know if it's possible to you know to correct so much damage that yeah this you know these religions have have are doing i'm not gonna go back into like right, right. into you know all this thousands of years of all the stuff that has happened Mm -hmm. But just as a mental exercise, if it's possible, I think, I think on paper it would be possible. But I don't know what it'll entail to have that transition have, you know, to be made or. Mm -hmm. It's just <clears throat> mostly like, you know, my mind creating more connections. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's possible or not. Oh, by the way, 
Um, I think uh, seven, seven, six and a half, which is the um, a book that uh, James Eshelman is publishing. You can find it on uh, Thelima.org. Is basically a seven, 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 but with well, not seven, seven, seven in itself, but it's like the table of uh, correspondences, and it's just kind of like organized so that is for somebody that doesn't want to deal with that you know like it's, it's a little more like easier to to uh, to navigate and um, there's on the table of correspondences is 98 uh, table you have the correspondences to Christianity which is you can go over there like you know how they organized um, the Virgin Mary will be, of course, attributed to Bina. Uh, five is Christ coming to judge the world. Six, God the Son. And I will put also the secret heart, heart of Jesus here mm -hmm. in Tefer. Um, anyway, it's like very interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, what I like about the Lima is that you could still work with a specific tradition, but use the Lima and hermeticism as a lens over your tradition to get a different perspective and understanding of it. Um, I think like the Abrahamic religions are the biggest and uh, I guess I could say some of them have caused some of the most hurt in the world whether it's the Inquisition or it's wars and holy wars and you know fighting over territories in certain places in the world. Um, coming to terms with the Book of the Law, Libra Oz, doing one's will, and not fighting for no reason other than socio-economic political advancement is mostly what they actually fight over, uh, and they hide it behind religious wars, but, um, you know, I, I think it's an interesting project to bring people from those religions that are you know, over the hundreds of years causing the most problems into a new light where if they could evolve consciously there would be a lot less problems probably. Yeah, one of the things that I notice is that um, you are, like we're not supposed to be so rigid spiritually and we are, we should be able to understand that the symbols are different di in different locations and in different traditions, but they see they're the same thing. They're representing the same energies and the same forces. Mm -hmm. So there's no problem on seeing um, that this particular deity is the same idea that is so the particular deity, which is the whole point of you know like this seven seven seven, which is something that was given to Crowley in the Golden Dawn. Conspiracy theorists make a point of wondering why, and it must be aliens is what they say, why two cultures on opposite sides of the globe come up with the same symbols in their, in their religions and build the same things. And it, it's what you said, it's because they're all observing the same truth from the same human experience and they came to the same conclusions because if you really get down to the core of truth and spirituality and of it, I'll call it occultism for lack of a better term, when you get to the core of divinity, you end up coming to the same conclusions. If you're analyzing the same exact universe from the same exact human condition, you, and you were correct on both sides, you're going to come to the same conclusions. And in my opinion, it's not any of these crazy conspiracies because they observe the same truth from a human experience and they came to the same conclusion. So they both hit it on the head. They might have a different language or a different depiction slightly in, in its drawing or imagery or whatever, but it means the same thing. It translates the same exact thing. Um, so when you could get to that point of, oh, it doesn't matter what your religion is, you are worshipping the same thing I'm worshipping, you're doing the same thing I'm doing, you're having a human experience. Don't hurt somebody because of that. Don't try to abuse somebody because you think your religion is right and they're wrong and that gives you justification to hurt or enslave or murder or whatever. Like Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a big project <laughs> to say the least. Yes. Um any any closing remarks? I think uh 
No, I mean, I... I hope somebody find, finds this entertaining or instructive or interesting in a way. So I guess that's... Thank you so much for doing this. Thank um, you so much for been inviting me. Coming. Yeah, this was great. Um, so with that, uh, love is the law. Love, love under will. will. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you so much. Thank you.